Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm Pastor Lauren Michelle, and it is great to have you with us. Today's theme we'll be talking about is forgiveness. Have you ever been mad at somebody and then you think that you've let it go and moved on and then maybe a week or two later you see their face somewhere, maybe social media, maybe in person, and these feelings of resentment maybe rise up inside you or anger or annoyance. Today we'll be talking about what that is and what it looks like to forgive. So again, I'm just so glad that you're joining us here today. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, you're welcome here. If you heard my opening segment on the video last week, you know I mentioned our annual conference. That's the, the gathering that uh, we attend every year in June that's been now moved to September as a virtual gathering. I said that annual conference last week, I said annual conference worship is going to be held on September 27th. No, wrong. I was wrong. Okay, wrong date. I said the wrong date. It will be September 20th, which is next Sunday, okay, a week from right now. All of us are going to worship together with other United Methodist congregations in Northern California and Nevada. And it's going to be done virtually. Next Sunday will be a little different than what we have been doing. So far, when you see Pastor Lauren Michelle and me and our musicians here uh, online every Sunday morning, you know, we've recorded all of these portions earlier. We've recorded them ahead of time. Uh, but next Sunday, you'll have an opportunity to watch the annual conference Sunday service live while it's happening. And it will be at 10 o'clock next Sunday morning. Click on the link that we are going to send to you. And if you cannot participate by seeing it live, we also will have a recorded version in the same spot uh, afterwards, at some point after that service. Uh, on the worship page of our website. So the moral of the story is, pay close attention to your email later this week for instructions and plan to join us live for our annual conference Sunday worship service next Sunday, the 20th at 10 a.m. Hi everyone, Pastor Joe here. Well, we're going to have children's moment from my house today because I wanted to introduce to you a new member of our family about, well, she's new about a month ago. And her name is Holly. Holly, come here, Holly. Come here, Holly. Oh, look at that. A little puppy. So Holly's a good puppy, but she's growing. She was only about half this size when we first got her. Hey. Ah. She's chewing, my, she's chewing on my hands. One thing you'll know about puppies, they just love to chew. They just love to chew. Now, let me ask you some questions. Would it be okay if... Would it be okay if I just... Um, if Holly just wanted to play out in the street? Would that be okay? No, we couldn't do that. She might get hurt. Would it be okay if Holly had, like... If Holly ate a whole bag of chocolate chip cookies, would that be okay? No, that wouldn't be okay. In fact, sometimes we have to say, no, no, Holly, you can't play in the street. And no, you can't, you can't eat a bag of chocolate chip cookies. And no, you can't chew on my hands. You can't chew on my hands. In fact, her little teeth really hurt. So, sometimes it's important that we just have to tell Holly no. And it's not because... We're trying to be mean, it's just because we love her and we don't want her to get hurt and we don't want her to get sick. And so we, <laughs> she's biting on my hand. And then, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, you know, sometimes your mom and dad, they have to say no to you. You don't get to do everything you want because, and it's not because they're trying to be mean, it's because they love you. Sometimes, um, Sometimes we have to do, we have to say no, and we have to, we have to do things like that um, because the people around you love you. 
And so I just want you to remember that, that when you, oh, what a cute little puppy. I want you to remember that um, God wants you to be safe and sound. And sometimes your parents have to say no because we want to keep you safe and sound, just like this little puppy. Okay, well, thanks for joining me today. And, and Holly, hey, look up. Look up. Up here. Right here. I'm trying to get Holly to look up and say goodbye. Yeah, I can't really get her to look up anymore. I guess she's I guess she's getting kind of tired. Say bye, Holly. Oh well. Anyway, we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming. Bye kids. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my sibling sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king 
who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell onto his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay me what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have mercy, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. When his Lord summoned him and said to him, Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your siblings from your heart. May God grant our understanding the reading of this word, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, before we dive into today's text, I'd like to tell you a story about cookie dough. This story is purely hypothetical, so even if it sounds like it's something that maybe happened to me in real life, I just want to clarify that it is hypothetical. Last night, hypothetically speaking, I was thinking I needed a late night treat. I remembered that about a week ago, I got some disappointing news and I decided to indulge in a little bit of refrigerated cookie dough from my local grocery store, hypothetically, of course. And after the Instacart delivery person dropped it off, I ate a few wonderful, comforting, satisfying bites of raw cookie dough and did not get salmonella, I might add. I hunted down a freezer size Ziploc bag so that I could put the rest of it in the freezer. Or so I thought. You see, last night, I hypothetically got a craving for cookie dough and opened my freezer but it wasn't there. So I thought, oh, I must have just put it in the fridge, thinking I might want some more later. So I open my fridge, it's not there. I think, well, maybe it's just stuck behind something. So hypothetically, I take everything out of the fridge and the freezer, and there's still no cookie dough. So then I hypothetically looked up and down my entire house from top to bottom for this cookie dough. Now, I bet you're thinking, where does cookie dough come up in the Bible? Well, as far as I know, it doesn't. But it does relate to today's scripture about forgiveness. Today finds us in the 18th chapter of Matthew. Jesus talks to the disciples about humility and how it's super, super important in the kingdom of heaven. Apparently cookie dough was not important. From there he talks about how the disciples should not only worry about themselves, but also consider how their actions might affect those around them. The parable of the unforgiving servant is the final story of the 18th chapter of Matthew and arises as a culmination in the importance of treating each other as God would. Because Jesus introduces the story as a comparison, the disciples understand, and we are told, that there is a parallel between the kingdom of heaven and the king's kingdom in the story. Other characters in the story are slaves, because Jesus used the surrounding society's context since it's what the listener would have been familiar with. Echoing earlier statements in Matthew, Jesus reminds the disciples of normal community expectations and then takes it a step further. Jesus is illuminating how they, 
and we are called to forgive one another. Right off the bat, the situation is dire. The slave owes an immense amount of money. And I'm not just talking like a lot of money. It's such a large amount of money that the request to pay it back is laughable. It's the equivalent of at least 60 million days of a standard laborer's wages. The slave clearly cannot pay it back. So the slave begs for forgiveness and the king forgives all the debt. If the story had ended there, I think it would have made a pretty powerful point. But the passage takes a turn and reiterates the power of forgiveness and also the power of when somebody chooses not to forgive. A second situation, much less grandiose than the first, is presented. The first slave demands that this second slave pay some amount of money that the second slave owed. It was a much smaller amount of money, maybe equivalent to like 100 days of work, so something that could have been paid back or perhaps could have been earned and then paid back. But the first slave doesn't show forgiveness. The first slave shuts the second slave in prison. The other slaves report the actions to the king, and the king admonishes slave one and then has him tortured. Jesus ends the parable stating that, as the king did, so will God in heaven do, if the disciples do not forgive one another from the heart. Now, let's go back to the beginning again, but this time with a little cookie dough thrown in. Peter starts it off by asking Jesus how many times to forgive a sibling, suggesting maybe seven times. Seven times? Peter would have used three of those times just for forgiveness after denying Jesus. So he better be glad that Jesus' forgiveness is a whole lot better than his suggestion. Everyone gives Thomas a bad rap with that whole doubting Thomas thing, but here we have soon to be in need of forgiveness Peter being all stingy with the forgiveness. I know it doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily, but still. On the other hand, I haven't forgiven myself for hypothetically losing the cookie dough yet, so something tells me that in reality, I would actually probably be on Peter's side. Not about denying Jesus, just about the forgiveness. But then Jesus chimes in. And as theologian Audrey West says, Jesus' response to Peter's question takes forgiveness out of the countable category. The forgiveness to which Jesus points is beyond one's capacity to keep tabs beyond one's capacity to offer on their own strength or ability. West says, and I agree, that it is God's compassion and abundant mercy that make radical forgiveness possible. So maybe the reason I haven't forgiven myself about the hypothetical cookie dough incident yet is because I need God's mercy. Or maybe I just need to not put an almost full package of cookie dough in the trash because I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Anyway, then we get to the part at the end where I get stuck. You know that part that talks about torture because the slave couldn't pay, followed up by talking about how that's what God would do. But in a way, that is kind of what happens when we don't forgive someone. The feelings of hate and vengeance and condemnation that are inside of us they don't torture the other person. They torture us. And so I wonder, when we have received so much compassion and mercy and grace from God, and we understand how not forgiving another can also harm us, what keeps us from offering that grace to others? When I've read this story and I've listened to someone preach it, my mind always wanders to the things and the people that have done things that I consider unforgivable. My mind never goes to all the things that I've done that I should seek forgiveness for, 
or all the ways that I may have wronged people or contributed to systems that have wronged people in my life. My thoughts on forgiveness might be a little bit different if that's where my mind first went. But the fact of the matter is that for the person forgiving, forgiveness is hard. But Jesus does call those in a position of power, and now us, to forgive. Not to forget, but to cease to feel resentment or condemnation against another person. And that's hard. Whether it's forgiving someone else or yourself, perhaps for a deep disagreement, or perhaps for unkind words that were spoken, perhaps for hurt caused to yourself or another, it's not easy, but we're called to keep trying. And that brings me to something called cancel culture. Cancel culture is the practice of withdrawing support for public figures and companies after they have done or said something considered objectionable or offensive. Cancel culture is basically like group shaming via social media. It might look like not playing certain songs at, by certain artists at a wedding or a public figure losing sponsorship or ads, but let me be super honest with y'all for a minute. I love cancel culture. It feels good. There's a deep satisfaction in knowing that the person or the organization or the company has paid a price for doing something wrong. But that's all it is. It's not interested in, nor is it producing any real change in the person or in relationships. And it doesn't leave any room for forgiveness and grace. Instead, at least in my experience, it rewards those feelings of resentment and hatred and condemnation. And when those feelings are left unchecked, they can kind of overflow into all these other areas of your life. And they can become lenses through which we see the community that we have and that we share with one another. When we revel in those feelings of resentment, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that that's not how God's kingdom here on earth should look. The person with all the power in the story gives it up in the name of forgiveness. And in doing so, turns everything on its head. And that's what God does in our lives and what we should reflect into the world. Oppressive systems and power structures should be turned upside down with God's grace. These instances where we could have transformative moments of forgiveness and grace instead become moments of imprisonment. Those in power maintain oppressive power at the expense of forgiveness and grace because it's forgotten that this is not something that happens just once. This is an all day, every day, over and over and over again act of forgiveness. It's not as flashy as cancel culture. It's not as rewarding as maintaining the system society says we should. If you hold power, it doesn't seem as rewarding as maintaining the systems and hierarchies of power. Yet it is what the kingdom of God is supposed to be about. I don't have all the answers, and I don't really know how to get there except to keep trying and keep failing and keep trying again. I will be the first to say that forgiveness is not my strong suit. It's hard to forgive friends, family, people you work with, people that are part of structures that hurt you. It's hard to forgive people, period. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer, which I know at this church is something that's really meaningful to this community, and it's meaningful to Christians all over the world. We say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because we are trying to bring God's kingdom here on earth. This is a difficult story that Jesus tells. But it is a reminder to us that it is easy to talk about forgiveness, but not so easy to actually follow through. 
whether that be forgiving ourselves or others, or giving God those feelings of resentment and condemnation that we carry with us, and then asking God to take those feelings from us so that we can truly forgive. Join me in trying to find God's grace and trying to show it to others. We may not be great at it, but you gotta start somewhere. Amen and amen. We're so pleased to be able to come once again to the table, and I invite you to find elements that you may have in your home so that you can join with us in this uh, virtual celebration of the Lord's Supper. Whenever we gather as a church family, we're reminded of that night that Jesus sat at table with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. It was on that night as they were sharing the Passover meal together that Jesus took the bread of the Passover meal. And he gave it a brand new meaning. He took the bread and after giving God thanks and praise, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And then again after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving God thanks and praise, he gave it to them saying, drink this, each of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of this, Remember me. And so today as we gather in virtual community, we do remember. We remember in a way that brings the very presence of the risen Christ back into our midst. Truly, He is present with us wherever we might be, wherever you are, 
within the sound of my voice and the sight of this common table. Just as we share this one cup, we are reminded that we are one body in Christ, connected to God, connected to Christ and one another. And just as we share bread that has been broken, each and every week we are reminded that each one of us is broken in some way, in need of God's love, in need of God's forgiveness, in need of God's healing touch. And so we come to the table in that spirit. As you come to your own tables, I invite you to get to, to pull together the elements that you have, uh, whether, that, whether you are by yourself or whether you are with uh, other family members or whether you are with others that you call your family. Uh, we invite you to, uh, to share those elements uh, at this time. My friends, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Receive now these holy gifts. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we are so grateful for your presence here at this table. We are so grateful that that we feel your uh, love surrounding us as we share this holy meal. Uh, remind us that, that we are connected to you and to one another. That we are called to, to do some very hard and difficult things like forgiving one another, sharing your love with others, sharing your compassion and your strength. Lord, as we have shared this holy meal Help us to know that you are indeed with us, inside of us, surrounding us, walking with us. Go with us now and through this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we move now into our time of digital offering, we, I want to lift up once again how grateful we are for your continued support of our ministries. Uh, you can go directly to the page that brought you to this worship service, and you'll find there a, a button uh, where you can make an electronic donation to the ministries of this church. Uh, you can also send contributions, uh, pledges, and tithes directly to our church address here on East Street or to our P.O. Box, which is, you'll see uh, both of those, I believe, on, the, on the, uh, the connection newsletter that comes to you each week, either in print or electronically. Again, we're so grateful for the way that all of you have continued to support uh, our ministries, and we are grateful. As we move now into our time of prayer, I do want to lift up some folks in our church family that we are holding in prayer right now. Uh, Loris and Sherry Dobbins. Uh, I think I mentioned last week that, uh, that Loris was recovering from a recent uh, procedure. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Sherry uh, took a bit of a fall. And uh, she is, uh, she's over at Quartz Hill, Quartz Hill Rehab right now, uh, recovering uh, from a, uh, an injury to her back. And so we want to keep Sherry in our prayers and also Loris during this uh, difficult time. We were saddened this past week to hear that uh, Nancy Pescianino, who is a regular attender in our worship services, that she lost, she lost her daughter this past week. So we want to hold Nancy and indeed her entire family uh, in our prayers uh, for the loss of her daughter Bridget. And, and let us... Uh, let us offer prayers of support and strength uh, to Nancy and her entire extended family. Uh, Pat Flower uh, has been having some health uh, difficulties, but we are, uh, we are grateful to, that uh, she is doing better right now, and we just want to continue to lift up Pat Flower in our prayers. Uh, the same goes for Jim Doty, Jim Doty, who was uh, recovering down uh, at Oak River down in Anderson uh, following broken leg and broken ribs and we continue to hold Jim Doty in our prayers as we do Shirley Davis and Marge Reed as they continue uh, their treatments. Well, let's bring our hearts together now as, as, we, as we lift up those names. You will also see some other names that are listed there in your weekly connection uh, in our little prayer corner uh, area. And uh, let's hold all those folks in our prayers as we come before God in a time of prayer. Would you join me right now? Eternal God, come near to us and just surround us once again as we, as we quiet ourselves today. We pray that we might become open to your grace and your, your presence. Just as we are so thankful to be able to worship today, and to be a part of this community in the same way we express our gratitude for your strength and for your, for your steadfast presence in our lives. Lord, you know the feelings that are upon our hearts this day. In this, in this holy time, we lift up to you the silent concerns, the joys, the struggles, the celebrations that we bring with us, as well as these prayers that, that I have spoken aloud. 
We know, Lord, that You hear the prayers of our hearts and You take those prayers unto Yourself. As we worship this day, God, remind us that it is so much easier to talk about forgiveness, but practicing forgiveness and truly forgiving, it's hard work. And sometimes, God, we can only do it with the strength that You give to us. Lord, our hearts are breaking this day for so many towns and regions that have been hit with fire. Be with those who have fled from their homes, God. Give them courage and comfort and may Your love be revealed in the care that is being offered and extended in each and every community. As so many reached out to us two years ago, may we also respond and reach out to those most in need during this difficult time. Today we also pray for firefighters throughout California. God, give them strength and determination as they may be feeling completely overwhelmed by the task in front of them working through intense heat, working through very, very difficult conditions. We pray for their safety and that you will guide them in their work. This day as we worship and, and today as we come to your table, help us to be attentive and open to you. Help us to watch and to listen, to feel your presence even in this difficult time as we share together now the prayer that your beloved Son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, amen. We are so grateful that you were able to join us in worship today. Receive now our benediction, our sending forth. My friends, go now in peace. Love God and serve the people. And may our God, the God who, who gives us that inner strength and resilience, the ability to, to, to pull from a source beyond ourselves that we might actively practice uh, forgiveness in our lives and in um, our relationships with others. May the God that gives us that strength go with you now. Go in God's peace. Go in God's presence. Go in God's grace. Amen.